With that being said, let's get started, okay? We're actually going to go to Ecclesiastes this morning. All right, we're going to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 5, if you will, and we're going to go to verse 8. If you please stand for the first reading of Scripture in honor and reverence of the Word of God. We're going to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Just going to pray this over our service this morning, and then we'll get rolling in James. It says this, If you see oppression of the poor and perversion of justice, in righteousness in the province. Don't be astonished at the situation because one official protects another official and higher officials protect them. They profit from the land and it's taken by all. The king is served by the field. The one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This too is futile. When good things increase, the one who consumes them multiply. What then is it a profit to his owner except to watch and them eat it with their own eyes. The sleep of the worker is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich permits him no sleep. Let's pray. You may be seated. Lord Jesus, as we gather a surprise Christian church in your name this morning, God, so many of us feel the burden of these verses, Lord. We see corrupt governments, corrupt officials, God, things that are outside of our control, people that are taken advantage of. God, justice is never met. It seems like God, the evil in this world always seems to triumph. God, help us as we go through those struggles to recognize that, Lord Jesus, you, you are Lord, that all heaven and earth belongs to you, that you're sitting at the right hand of God. Lord, help remind us that even when we see these things, they won't last forever. But your glory and your justice, your truth, your goodness, that is what will last forever. So God, help us this morning as we gather, be reminded that riches, wealth, stuff, the things of this life, they're all passing away. God, but your kingdom lasts forever. God, you're at the door. Lord Jesus, you're at the door. You warn us. My time is near. Help us, God, be encouraged in our faith that we would be prepared for that day, the day of your return. Lord, you're an awesome God. Praise the name of Jesus, name of all names. Amen. Amen. All right, go ahead and head to... James. All right, we are going to the very last chapter of James. We almost finished this book together. If you haven't been with us, we've been going through a journey verse by verse through, through this letter that James is writing to a church that seems to have a lot of different issues. And we talked about how this is wisdom literature, so it doesn't necessarily flow one thought after the other. Instead, it's a series of teachings, okay, that each one of them is, is kind of self-contained. James has talked about a lot of things, all right, the rich and the poor, suffering through persecution, trials. But these last few weeks, we focus in a lot on really the church. What causes divisions in the church? What causes these wars and these factions? Why are these leaders jumping up to want to be viewed as wise or important? This weekend's a little different, all right? And when I read this chapter this week, when I read these verses... I just want to warn you ahead of time. James is just really, really clear with what he's going to say here, all right? Honestly, it really won't need a whole lot of explanation. When you hear it, you'll go, whoa, what is going on right here? Because he is serious and pretty intense about what we're going to talk about today. But through the midst of this, very similar to last week, I just have one main point today, and it's simply this, that Jesus is Lord. All right, exact same point from last week, Jesus is Lord. And we're going to see why that's so important today, because today we're not talking about really leaders and things like that. What we're talking about today is the balance of the rich, all right, and the poor, but we're also going to be talking about what it looks like to wait for Jesus, to wait for Jesus. And when we see corruption in the world, when we see evil in the world, when we see injustice in the world, that we wait for Jesus, because he's the one who's going to bring justice, right? So today is serious, but I want you to engage with me on this idea because it's really important for the way we live. So we're in James 5. I just want to read this first stretch of the passage, and then we'll explain that, and I'll save the second half, all right, for the, the back end of the sermon today. But just hear this verse. Let it, let it sit with you for a second. James 5, he says this. Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you 
and will eat your flesh like fire. You have stored up treasure in these last days. Look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your fields cry out. And the outcry of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of armies. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous who does not resist you. Just in this opening, I'm sure that you, like me, when you hear that, hear the very serious tone that James just begins this passage with, right? I mean, this is probably as clear and as in your face as you're going to get, right? He begins with this image, all of you rich, come listen to me. Now weep and wail, all right? Weep and wail. Now that is not the opening to a, to a love story, right? That is not a, the opening to a Disney movie, okay? That is, that is a serious, serious statement. And he says, why? Why should you weep and wail? Because these miseries are coming on you. And then he lists out these miseries, right? What are the miseries? Your wealth is gonna rot and your clothes are gonna be moth-eaten, right? Your gold and your silver are gonna corrode and fall apart. And their corrosion will be a witness against you. And then even further, they're gonna eat your flesh like fire. You stored up all this treasure. Now look, the pay that you withheld from all these people, from these workers, right? They have, they have cried out and the Lord of armies has heard them. And now you've lived your life luxuriously, but what you didn't realize is you were just prepping yourself for this day of judgment, this day of slaughter, okay? That's the image that he's giving it's pretty serious stuff, and it's pretty negative, and so it leaves us with this question, all right? He invites all the rich, and there's this very serious passage, so here's the question we have to wrestle with. Is it a bad thing to be rich in this world? All right? That's what I want to invite you into today. Is it a bad thing to be rich in this world? Based on how negative this passage is, we might come to the conclusion right away, yes, right? Look at what's happening to the rich in this passage. But there's more to this story. And I think we, to understand the seriousness of this, we have to kind of go all the way back to the beginning of scripture, all right? All the way back to that first story in the garden with Adam and Eve, because that first story is what sets the stage for this, for this very harsh passage, but very powerful passage. What happened in the garden? God made Adam and Eve and he gave them this, this perfect world, right? I've designed it all for you. It's all very good. I've given you this whole world, now I want you to rule and to reign. It all belongs to you, right? And he made them this beautiful garden, cool weather like we finally, finally got here in Arizona. Thank you, Lord Jesus, right? That, the cool days where the wind just blows in and everything is, is just wonderful. And man, there's just this peace about this place and God has made it perfect and all the food they could ever want is available to them, right? And anything they could ever need is, is all theirs. And more than that, they walk with God himself and talk with him like a friend day in and day out. We've talked about this story a bunch of times because it sets the stage for so much of what happens in scripture. But what do we know happens in this story? They have everything except one thing, right? God says, there's this tree there's this fruit, the knowledge of good and evil. You cannot eat from it. If you do, you will die, right? This is the one thing you can't have. The one thing in all of what I've made that doesn't belong to you. And we can wrestle with the why. Like, why did we put the tree in the garden? Why is it there? Why allow this in the first place? None of that really matters. All that matters is God has said, don't eat from this tree. Don't eat from this tree is all I'm asking you. Everything else is yours, but just don't eat from this. And we know the story, right? Serpent comes, says to, that, to Eve, oh, God's lying to you, right? He's, he's not gonna kill you. He knows if you have that, you'll be like him because you'll have everything, right? And you can be like God. So Eve eats, Adam, oh, poor Adam, right? No, no, not poor Adam. He's standing right there, right? He lets his wife be the guinea pig. Let's see if she dies first, okay? And then, and then if she doesn't die, maybe I'll eat the fruit. And so he watches her eat the fruit. She eats the fruit. She hands it to him. Well, she didn't die, now I'll, now I'll eat, right? And he eats the fruit as well. We all know the consequences that come. Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. The ground is cursed. The serpent is cursed. Women are cursed with pain and childbearing. Men are cursed with the, the, the thorns and thistles and the pain of working the ground. All of this happens, right? And the world falls apart. I bring that up because ever since that moment, that moment that, that happened in the garden, something has changed 
in human life, all right? Before we had everything, before we had everything, all we could ever need, and God said, just this is the only thing that you can't have. But since we took that, now what life is gonna look like is we're gonna struggle to have anything at all, all right? Before we had everything, and now everything that we do have seems to crumble and fall apart. It doesn't last. One of the most powerful books that I've read is by uh, A.W. Tozer called The Pursuit of God. It's an amazing, amazing book, and I, I encourage you to read it. But he gives this quote that I wanted to share with you guys because I think it, it'll help us when we, we're trying to understand what's going on here. He says this. This is what happened after the garden. Things have become, hold on to that word. What does that say? Necessary to us. All right? Things have become necessary to us. A development that was never originally intended. All right? God's gifts now take a place of God. And the whole course of nature is upset by this monstrous substitution. So what happens after the garden? Before we needed nothing. And now all of these things in God's world now become necessary. They become needed. And as a result, we take those things that God gives us, and where do we put them? Where God used to be. So where God was the center before, now this next thing is the center. Now this next thing is the center. Now this next thing is the center. And this is what human nature looks like. We take the things of the world, and we put them in the place of God. That is our nature from that moment in the garden. Well, why do I bring this story up in relation to what we're talking about today? Being wealthy, being rich, has the ultimate temptation to take stuff that isn't God and put it in his place, right? Because now, not only do I have a little bit of stuff that I can put there, but I have a lot of stuff that I can put there, right? And I can shift between these various things. Because of that, wealth becomes this unbelievable temptation to put things in the place of God. If you don't believe me, Jesus talks about this all the time. All the time, Jesus talks about this. So come with me and I'll show you. Matthew, we're going to Matthew. We're going to go actually all the way back. I want to show you one verse really quick. Jesus' longest sermon recorded in scripture begins... In Matthew chapter 5, in verse 3, it's called the Beatitudes. And the very first thing Jesus says in his first and longest sermon to the disciples is this. Blessed are who? The poor in spirit. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. That word poor there literally means beggars. All right? He says, blessed are the beggars. Jesus' first sermon all right, begins with that. Imagine if I came in and my first servant, and you, the first time you ever heard me, and the first thing I say is, blessed are the beggars in here, all right? Blessed are the beggars. Is that what we're taught from the world? No, right? But Jesus begins with this idea, blessed are the beggars in what? In their spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So Jesus, first thing he wants to emphasize to his disciples and to his listeners is that the most blessed thing you can be is a beggar. And why is the most blessed thing you can be a beggar? Because if you are a beggar in spirit, what does that say? That all of the things that I have are unimportant. The only thing that matters is God. The only thing that matters is God. Later, Jesus will give the Lord's Prayer. And remember, we went through this verse by verse together. And one of the passages in that prayer is what? Give us this day our daily bread. And if you remember when we went through that, what do we talk about the, the ultimate purpose of that is, right? It's an image of Israel in the wilderness, relying on God day in and day out. What was our purpose? That we should fully and completely rely on God to give us just what we need, right? To live this life well. Not too much, not too little. So again, Jesus teaches this idea. It doesn't stop there. You know, the third time in this sermon, this is what I really wanted to point out to you. In Matthew 6, in verse 19, he says this. Y'all know this verse. Come on, every, every children's ministry ever talks about, talks about this verse, okay? Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. This should sound familiar to the James passage. What does he say? Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, what's the next verse? There your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? What he's talking about is this evil eye that's always looking for more. No one can serve two masters since either he will hate one and love the other or he'll be devoted one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? And money. So in Jesus' first sermon and his longest sermon to his crowds and disciples, not once, not twice, but three times, he takes the time to say, it's blessed if you're a beggar. It's blessed if all you do is rely on God day in and day out just for what you need, just enough. Not too much, not too little. And what's the cursed situation? To have this eye that's always seeking after more. More money, more stuff, more things. Three times Jesus mentions his possessions, stuff. Why? Well, this isn't the only time he's going to say this. One of Jesus' favorite sayings is recorded in all the Gospels is, pick up your cross and follow me. And what does that mean other than give up everything you have and choose me alone, right? So Jesus cares quite a bit about this idea that we have taken stuff and put it where God belongs. That ever since the garden, what you and I have a temptation to do is to look at all the things of life and say, that's my God instead of the true, true God of the universe. So James gives a very serious teaching. He lays out, all right, that this is the reality of what it looks like for people who have wealth. And the question is why? And ultimately what James is hitting on here is none of it is going to last, right? That's his point. And the more you have, the more eventually you will lose. That's, that's the thing he's trying to get across. The more wealth you have, the more stuff you have, the more you have, the more you will lose because nothing lasts. Nothing lasts. That's the image of the moth, right? And the corrosion of the silver and the gold. That's the point. All of these things won't last and you have chosen to pile up all these temporary things and to hoard them for yourselves instead of prioritizing the eternal prioritizing the eternal. This passage is is tough, but what if you're (laughs) you're saying, all right, Drew, but, but there are all sorts of amazing people in scripture who have lots of things, right, but still serve God. And I say, absolutely, absolutely. Being rich in and of itself is no sin. In fact, it can be an amazing sign of God's blessing on your life. I mean, think of Abraham and all that God blessed him with. But I want you to think about that story about Abraham for a second. Yes, Abraham had it all. He had riches, he had family, he had the leadership of his tribe. He was promised all these descendants in this amazing land God was gonna give him. But what does God in that process teach Abraham? The one story that all of us struggle with but is so powerful is what? When God asks Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac. And the question is, why does God do that? And I think it's to teach Abraham a lesson. Nothing that you have belongs to you. I have given you much, but it's all still mine. It's on loan to you for a little while, but eventually I'm going to take it back. And so Abraham is able to do the thing that all of us struggle to do. You see, he could have very easily put his son on that altar of his heart, said, this is my God but he chose God instead. Again, going back to Tozer, one of the most amazing quotes, he talks about this, he talks about Abraham and this story, and he says this, he had everything, but he possessed nothing. Do you hear that? He had everything, but he possessed nothing. There is the spiritual secret There is the sweet theology of the heart, which can be learned only in the school of renunciation. His point is, Abraham had all this stuff, 
but there was nothing that he looked at God and said, this is mine. You know, one of the best uh, blessings of life is having, is having kids. And I love my, my two girls more than anything. Marcy has been making me very sad recently because every day now when I go to work or when I'm even on my days off when I'm home, as soon as she sees me walking out the door, she runs, okay? And she grabs me and she says, Dad, can I go work to work with you? <laughs> Every day. And I'm like, oh my goodness, tear my heart out. Like, what am I supposed to say to this beautiful little girl saying, Dad, just stay with me or, or at least bring me with you, right? I, I want to go to work with you. And Every day I have to say, no, you can't go to work with me, right? But I'll be back later. And it, it's, gotten, it's gotten to the point now, like I said, with my days off where I'll go to like leave to get a coffee or a drink or whatever, and she'll see me leaving. And she's like, Dad, I want to go with you, right? Don't leave. I'm going to go with you. And she makes a big deal about it, all right? I'm getting my shoes on. I'm getting my clothes on. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> From our youngest age, even with things that are wonderful, like a love of our parents, right? I have my love for my little girl. From our youngest age, we're taught, man, I've got to hold on to this, right? I've got to possess this. I, I love my dad. He can't go anywhere. He's got to stay with me, right? And that's a beautiful version of that. But there's obviously, when you're raising kids, some not so beautiful versions of that, right? Oh, my friend's over, and the friend has the dinosaur that I want, all right? <laughs> That's my dinosaur. This has happened. All right, I'm going to go. Kids are awesome because they don't even care about anything else. They're just going to go take that dinosaur right then and there. I don't care <laughs> how you feel. It's just going to happen. And they just snatch that dinosaur. My dinosaur, right? From our youngest age, it's just built into our human nature to take, to want, to possess, and to hold on to things, to make them ours and nobody else's, to grasp them, all right? And in this passage, James is saying to all these people, and notice they haven't grown out of being toddlers, have they? All these rich people, who do they rob? Who are they stealing the dinosaur from? They're workers. Man, what a challenging passage for us in the U.S. today. And you better hear it. It's the word of the Lord, right? It's a challenging passage to us today that God is so clear on this. You have robbed your workers, and their cry has come to the Lord of armies, right? Right? You have robbed and stolen their wages and their time for your own benefit. Don't think I haven't noticed, right? That is some serious stuff. And these cries hear him. They've, they've taken everything and they've indulged themselves and they've hidden it all away. It's my money, my savings, my possessions, my stuff, not yours. And what's God's warning? No, it's not. No, it's not. All that you have back here and you think is yours is actually mine. And you'll find out one way or another, either through time, because someday you'll die, and that money will go off to your kids or to your grandkids or whatever. And Ecclesiastes talks all about this, right? What happens when it goes off to kids and grandkids who didn't own it and didn't earn it? Sometimes they'll take it and they'll do what with it? Party and drink and burn it away, right? And then where all your possessions gone, they're nothing but a memory, right? And he looks back and he says, okay, well, maybe you can hold on to it for a little while, but guess what's going to happen? Raw, sorry, rust and moth destroy, time wears on, corrosion, everything will pass. You know, we have this uh, in the back of the room there, right above the tithe box, there's this old coin, all right? And it's from one of the stories in, in the Bible. I encourage you to take some time to look at it. All right, it's a certified coin. It's a, it's a widow's mite from the story where Jesus is talking about the widow who gives her two pennies. There's all these guys coming in and they want to show how much they're donating and how much they're giving. And this widow, all she has left is two pennies and she offers that. And Jesus says she has given more than any of them, right? More than all of them combined. Well, that's actually one of those widow's mites, okay? It's one of the pennies that she gave. And it's, I think, an amazing reminder sitting above that tithe box of who we give to and why we give. But if you go look at that coin, you won't see a whole lot of anything on it, right? It's a small little coin, and almost all of the image that was on it has been eroded away. It's just got dirt, and right? For a long time in Jesus' day, they would have traded all sorts of big, beautiful coins with Caesar on them and all sorts of gods and other things. Where are all those coins now, right? They might be in a collector's box. For the most part, they're worthless unless you trade them for money that's used today, Right? All your money won't last. It will rot and corrode and disappear and be forgotten. Your house will be sold to somebody else. Your collection of whatever it is that you've built up will be tossed away 
because someone won't value them the way you do. All your heirlooms will be lost and no one will remember who gave them in the first place, right? All of it is meaningless. But just like toddlers, we hoard it all up thinking it's a big deal. That little plastic dinosaur that my Marcy wants so badly, she's willing to fight another toddler over it, right? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. We hoard all this meaningless, pointless stuff and act like we're important. Act like we've done something great. Um, But let me just say this to you. You're not great to God. You're not great to God. All right? No matter how much wealth you have, you can never be more important than just what you are. A human being. And so this warning is true. And so how how do we apply this, all of us? We have to learn that we can have everything in life, really. God wants to give us amazing blessings, and he does very often. I mean, think about all the things you have in life. Thanksgiving's coming up. I'm sure you all will go around the table and say, all right, you say what you're thankful for now, right? You say what you're thankful for. You know, those are great things. God has blessed you. But don't be foolish enough to think that you can possess them. That you can possess them. Ultimately, they don't belong to you. Uh, My wife doesn't belong to me, right? She belongs to God. My kids don't belong to me. They belong to God. My money doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. This church doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. And all of it, right, will fade, but God never will. We have to learn that we can have things, but we can't possess anything. When you possess, what you're doing is you're taking something from the world and you're saying, this is my God. I can't lose it. I refuse to lose it, and I'll do anything to keep it, right? That's your God. That's your God. Continuing on, verse seven, I wanna read you the second half of the passage because it's this amazing encouragement. Because actually, James is gonna be assuming that for all of us who are listening, we already know all of this (laughs) because we're Christians, And so you've been invited by Jesus to pick up your cross and follow him. You've been invited to give up everything for his kingdom. You've been been called already. You're already a Christian. You know these things. You know that you can't possess, that you can only have the things that God blesses you with. He's saying, you guys all know this. This isn't really about you. And actually hear that in this next verse because he goes, come you rich in the first verse. And what does he begin with in the second one? Therefore, who? Brothers and sisters. All right, now I'm talking about the church. You guys know all that stuff about money, and none of y'all are doing that. But come here, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. He says, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early, and this is important, don't miss this, the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door picking up from our teaching last weekend. He's just reminding them, right? Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of what? Suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance, haven't you? And have seen the outcome that the Lord's brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Where does he kind of end this this story? He ends this story with a figure that all of us should know because when you think of having everything and possessing nothing, there is no better character in the Bible to approach that with than Job. You better believe, right? And what's Job's story? That he had everything. Boy, did he have everything. He had all the money and the wealth and the lands and all, he was blessed in every possible way. Kids, grand, everything else he could imagine. It's all his. And right, you know that story. The devil comes to God and says, yeah, but look at what all of you have given him. Of course he worships you. Look how good his life is. If you just took that stuff away, he would no longer worship you. And so that's the whole story, right? The devil takes all of that away. And in the end of the story, Job still worships God. It's amazing. Beautiful story of someone who possesses nothing. And the end of the story is God restores 
more than Job even had at the beginning, right? He doesn't just bless him. He blesses him over and over and over again, gives him even more money, gives him even more homes, gives him even more land, gives him even more kids. He gives him all the things he had before, plus much, much more. So James brings this up as a perfect story to encapsulate the whole thing he's trying to get across to the church. Don't be like the rich, be like Job, right? And wait for the Lord. If you have from the early rains, did you hear that in the passage, right? Those early rains have come in your life from, from your earliest age to, to now. You have had great success in life. You've had no worries about money. You've had all the things you could ever ask for. That's the early rains, right? Those are the things that go great in life and God's given a harvest. And then maybe after that, all of that falls away, right? And all that's lost like Job. Be patient in that time and wait for the late rains. That rain that comes later and causes that growth again. His whole point is don't be like the rich, be like Job. Have everything and possess nothing. I want to give us some simple lessons for disciples today, all right? Here's the first thing I want to say. Jesus is Lord, so he must be the one sitting on the throne of our hearts, all right? Jesus is Lord, so he must be the one sitting on the thrones of our hearts. And that, again, I want to emphasize, does not just mean money. There are all sorts of things that we put on the throne of our hearts. There are all sorts of things, but Jesus is Lord. When we say that, we're saying, he's my everything. If I lost it all and I had him, I would still have everything, right? Because Jesus is Lord. But that could be really hard, all right? That could be really hard because there are a lot of things that, boy, man, it, we're just told we have to possess. Our hearts cry out and say, no, you've got to hold this as tight as you can. Wonderful things. Our spouse, our kids, our parents, our family life. Wonderful things, right? And we, we put those. But, but here's what I need you to hear from me today. Any other God but Jesus is a cruel God. I really mean that. Any other God but Jesus is a cruel God in your life. If you choose money to be your God, your life will be miserable. I mean that. I don't care how rich you are. Your life will be miserable. If money is your God, it is a cruel master. It really is. Remember what I said a few weeks ago. When does the rich man have enough? When he has a little more than he already has. All right? When he has a little more than he already has. So if you choose money as your God, it will never satisfy you. There will always be something else you still need. There will always be something else you still want. It will never satisfy you because it comes and it goes. Boy, does it come and it go, right? When things go wrong, all of a sudden that God, that foundation for so many wealthy people who have invested their money here or there and then this crashes or that crashes and all of a sudden they're more poor than they've ever been or anyone's ever been it feels like in life and they have nothing. It's a cruel master. It will abandon you in a heartbeat. Your foundation, your security, it can disappear overnight, right? Money is a cruel God. But there are other things that are cruel gods. Your kids are a cruel God, all right? And I'm not saying this. Your kids are awesome. I believe they're awesome. But once you put them in the place of God, they will be a cruel God to you. They will. They will ruin your life. I mean that. You cannot have your kids as your God because they can't live up to it. They can't live up to it. They will be a cruel God in your life. Sex is a cruel God. I mean, we should all know that, right? Seems obvious. I mean, just look at what that God does. Look at the porn industry, right? Look at those things that came out when we all were watching, right, that movie together, Sound of Freedom, and we were all seeing those things that happened with child sex trafficking, all those things that happened in the world. Sex is one of the cruelest gods there is. It's one of the cruelest gods there is. All of these things are cruel gods. They're cruel to you or somebody else, right? The reason we want Jesus on the throne is not just because he is God, which is also true, but because he is kind and merciful and compassionate and he is a good, good God. When Jesus is on the throne, peace lasts forever, not just temporary, right? When Jesus is on the throne, he is he's not cracking the whip, right? He's inviting you, come, 
Come, I'll give you rest. Jesus is an amazing God. And so the next thing that follows from this then is Jesus is Lord, so be patient and endure because the judge is at the door. Jesus is Lord, so be patient and endure because the judge is at the door. This is so important, and I don't want you to miss this, all right? There are not just those of us who have gods that are not Jesus on the throne, but there are those of us who have suffered at the hands of others who have gods that are not Jesus on the throne. You hearing me? You following me? So in your life, this thing called sin, it comes from that place. That there are people who have these gods on their hearts, and whether that's sex or money or whatever it is, that can cause real harm to the people around you. That's the whole point of what James is bringing up. You've, you've robbed these workers, right? You've stolen from them. You didn't just steal money, you stole time. Time away from their kids, time away from their families, time away from their friends, time away from their church. You stole that from them so you could hoard more, right? That's what he's saying. And so your God has robbed these other people, and the God will hold account for that. Same thing when these other gods come up, right? If, if someone has the God of sex on their, on their heart, right? And, and they molest a child or they rape somebody or they do something cruel and, and inhumane and horrible, the th- reminder is to all of them, the Lord is God and he has heard, he has seen, and he will not let it go, right? He has heard and he has seen and he will not let it go. The person who has power sitting on their throne, right? Who, who goes home and beats their husband or their wife, right? Who mistreats their children. The same thing is true. God says, I've seen, I have heard, and I will not let it go, right? That's the point. James' point is the judge is at the door. The judge is at the door. For all of us who have these gods sitting on the throne and who have caused so much hurt in this world, there's both a warning and an encouragement that for, for all of us who see that, we will all be able to say, right, child sex trafficking will not exist forever because the judge is at the door and he's going to put an end to it, right? All of these things I'm talking about, we can all say with hope and encouragement, Jesus is coming and he is Lord and not one of these gods will stand up before him. But there's one more truth that we can't leave without. And it's this, Jesus is Lord, so be encouraged because he is compassionate and merciful. That's how this verse ends, right? This verse ends with that little line, the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And so why why end there? Because it's an invitation to all of us who have God sitting on the throne that don't belong there, and to all of us who have harmed others in very serious and egregious ways, right? That the Lord is gracious, honestly. That even the most horrific sins that could be committed can be forgiven. That the Lord is judged, but he's also willing to pardon and show mercy. That because of what Jesus has done on the cross, right, all of those things can be paid for and be removed. But I don't want you to miss this, and, and I, I have to end here, and you, I need you to hear me. Please, please hear me. Just because God forgives doesn't mean, all right, that he has just let those things go. I want you to hear me in that, because we treat grace in such a way that it acts like God just looks at all these crimes and says, no big deal, right? As long as you just say you're sorry. It's not how God is. Over and over and over and over and over in scripture, God says, I hear the cries of the oppressed, right? I hear the blood cry out to me from the ground. I hear the injustice. I see every hurt. And the Lord calls himself an avenger. I will avenge these things, right? And I I think sometimes Christians get so weird about the justice of God. The justice of God is as good as it gets, y'all. Because that means there's not one person who's molested a child who will not get what's coming to them. The justice they deserve. And they do deserve it. But the the reality is, and the invitation to mercy and grace is not just I've let all this go. It's I have chosen to punish my son in your place. That's the mercy. It's not, 
well, I just forgot, no big deal. Uh, you know, rape, murder, child molestation, all these things. Nah, I don't care. Forgiven, I'm kind, right? No, it's you will pay for this or Jesus will. Those are the only options. Those are the only options. So, so I want you to hear me today because that warning is serious. And I think I don't want to come in here and read a passage that's serious and go, oh, he didn't mean it, right? That's not how this is. When he says your wealth will, will rot your flesh, and burn it like fire. That is not, ha ha ha, right? That is as serious as it gets. And he means it. And I mean it. If you leave that God on your throne, it will consume you. And it will consume the people around you. And there is a judge who will not let it go. He has seen, he has heard, and he will hold you accountable. Or Jesus can pay for it. And I want to invite you. Jesus has paid the price. Go to him. He is worthy and he is as kind and merciful as it gets. And he is the only God, truly, when he's on the throne, that will make your life not just good, not just happy, but eternally blessed. Pray with me. God, you're an awesome God. Lord, I thank you, God, that you're at the door. That soon you will come to judge the living and the dead. That all the crimes, God, of this life that have have gone up to your ears, God, all the cries of the innocent and the oppressed, God, that you've heard every one of them. I thank you, Lord, that you've been in every room and every place, You've heard every child, every woman, every man who has cried out, Lord, help me. Lord, give justice. Lord, this is wrong. I thank you, Lord, that you don't just hear those cries, but you answer them. God, that you answer them and you say, I am the King of kings. I am the Lord of lords. I am the judge, and I will make all things right. Lord, I thank you for your justice, but I also thank you for your mercy. Lord, for so long in my life, I have let this thing or that thing take a place on the throne. It doesn't belong there. God, I've hurt others. I've hurt people I care about because I've chosen to worship a God that's not you. So help me today, Lord, and help the people listening today, Lord. Crush those idols in their hearts. Turn them into dust so that they never attempted to go back to them again. And put you, Lord, the only true God, the place where you belong, on the throne. I pray this all in the name of Jesus, name of all names. Amen.